My name is Paul Handley. I'm the editor of the Church Times, and I'm thrilled to be here this morning. Uh, it's not the start of the festival because um, one of our speakers this morning um, was able to to uh, to conduct the session not in the cathedral last night. If anybody was there, you'll know how well he managed. Um, and he would like to have been here today, but COVID took its toll. Um, uh, both our speakers this morning actually are going to go back to bed after this session. Um, uh, uh, Stephen, because uh, of his illness, and, and Sam, because uh, it is five o'clock in the morning where he is in North Carolina. Um, so, um, a few things before we uh, talk to them. Um, if you've got, uh, I've just turned my phone down, which I think might be a good idea if anybody else um, hasn't remembered to do that. Thank you very much. Um, uh, the, um, uh, there will be uh, talks for about, um, about 40 minutes or so, and, or half an hour, and then there'll be time for questions. Uh, we have speakers in two different parts of the world. Uh, you're here. Nothing could possibly go wrong. Um, uh, we've got, um, but all the, all the technology is here. The, our, um, our speakers are, are, are live already. Um, uh, and um, uh, the conversation between them um, is going to be fascinating because um, we have two theologians uh, and two, two pastoral theologians in a way in that they've both um, developed their understanding of God through their ministry um, in the parish and elsewhere. Um, uh, the Archbishop of York needs no real introduction. Um, he is a, a significant member of, of um, the church hierarchy, but that's not the most important part of him. He is a, a, an author, a writer, and, and I think still a parish priest at heart. Um, uh, Sam Wells is, uh, is a parish priest. Uh, none of us understand how he can manage to be that as well as, uh, as the author of 40 plus books. Um, and um, uh, and also a, a, a working theologian. Um, he's. Um, I, 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 I was trying to think of a way of summing up his theology. Because a, a lot of writers um, make um, make th make God a, a simple concept. Um, a lot of people explain how complicated it is, but I think Sam takes the complications of our relationship with. God and um, and develops them in a very coherent and explanatory way. I, th I think um, if it weren't for people who who explain God as such a uh, a sensitive and therefore uh, comprehensive way, I think we would be the poorer for it. Um, I would like to hand over to them both because um, uh, they need to get back to bed after this. <laughs> so. Uh, Sam and Stephen, you are there. Uh, so, Paul, thank you very much. Uh, so, yes, yeah, so I, I'm, I'm Stephen Cottrell. I've been accused of many things in my life, but I don't think I've ever been accused of being a theologian before. Um, I, I think of myself as a preacher man. Um, and, and like the best preachers, I, I believe preachers are the best preachers are poets and storytellers. Uh, so that, that's what I do. Sam, Sam on the other hand, is, is a proper theologian. Um, and uh, it's his book we're here to talk about this morning. So you're going to hear much more from him than you than you are from me. Um, but as you picked up, he for him, it's five o'clock in the morning. Me, I got attacked again by the dreaded lurgy of COVID this week. And, and I'm, I'm still testing positive and feeling negative. Um, but there we are. Um, so it's going to be kind of like an ecclesiastical equivalent of last of the summer wine when a couple of old men chat chat with each other about about god and about justice because the the subject of our conversation is is um uh sam's latest book which is the third book in his trilogy um uh of walk humbly love mercy and now this book act justly and uh, for fans of sam's writing of which i'm one having read many of his books over the years it it I, I joked with him, but it wasn't really a joke. I always think his books are a bit of a roller coaster. I mean, one thing I like about his books is that they're thin. Um, uh, um, uh, uh, and in fact, with my, my own books are also thin. And the publisher actually says, please don't make them too long. Um, 
because if you want to write for an intelligent but not necessarily theologically formally theologically educated christian audience you know you you need to and and sounds books are they're very they're very readable uh, as well as very very stimulating uh, so sam a bit of an unfair first question um but this is a book festival so we're here to talk about books the title of the book at justly um but it's a book um so 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 um so i suppose my first question is how can a book be an action? How can a book be an action? And therefore, what's your hope for this book? Um, I guess, well, uh, thank you for having me to the festival and, and lovely to see you, Stephen. And um, I wish I could see everybody else and I apologize for not being with you in the building. Um, uh, the unexamined life is not worth living, as, uh, as Aristotle said, and this is an attempt to take a step back from uh, urgent calls for justice and calls for justice are always urgent so there's always an intensity about them and to be a little bit reflective before we pile in assume that we're on the side of righteousness and proceed accordingly so a book is an action in the sense that if you want to improve your action, you go on a kind of reflection cycle, action reflection cycle. And this is a kind of action reflection cycle, which possibly casts a, a wider canvas than a lot of books about, for example, social justice might might do. Uh, I, I think other books in this area, there's quite a few books, as I hint at one point in the book, I think probably in the introduction or preface um there's quite a few books that say gosh there's a lot about justice in the bible amen and then you close the book and so i decided not to write a book like that because i kind of take that for granted um and then there's quite a lot of books getting you more passionate about things that you probably were passionate about already most obviously things like racial justice and climate justice um but i take the view that we're all we're already all located somewhere in some kind of movement for justice just as we're already all located somewhere in some kind of movement for peace um, and we all want to enrich uh, and wisen up our practice so this is for uh, uh, there's also a sense here <clears throat> I guess two two other possible things to, to be said about it as a as an action book for, first of all to broaden the view of the church in general and possibly even wider than that about what kinds of actions count as justice so if you've got a friend or if you are yourself for example a solicitor or a barrister uh, on the face of it you're obviously involved in justice but but in the way justice is often spoken about in the church today and wider society then you're not you're not included because justice means marches and protests and petitions and so on and lobbying parliament and that kind of thing um, and so i wanted to give a, a greater sense of how we we all have a role in this rather than people who are who um, go on marches and so on and then everybody else who couldn't care less yeah I, I love your i love your emphasis on some of the details i think you use the word one of the chapters is called scrutinize and you 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 retell that the story from that that great film of a few years ago dark waters where the um, where in order to put off the solitary journalist i think it is who's who's investigating the company they deliver a kind of pantectian load of papers but he methodically painstakingly works his way through them um, and then towards the end of the book, you also used what I thought was a lovely example of, you know, so so does does the cleaner dust above the does the cleaner dust above the eye line of, um, you know, uh, and it's, it's those little it was justice being worked out um, in, in painful detail. Um, I don't know whether you want to say anything more about that. Yes, I guess that's back to the, the, the there's a there's a place for everybody in this, and in a sense, there's a there's a there's an element of justice in everything that that we might do in the way that we do it. If you think about the George Herbert poem, him, 
uh, teach me my God and King. It's that it's it's that everything can be done in a way that advances justice uh, or in a way that doesn't. Uh, I guess yeah. that the the major difference between this book and say Love Mercy, there's a, there's one single very big difference between they both have twelve chapters coincidentally. Um, but the difference is, in Love Mercy, I wrote a book about forgiveness and reconciliation, uh, also a painstaking process in most cases, but I deliberately didn't crowd it with lots of examples because it irritates me the way examples can be used in, in those kinds of um, scenarios. Uh, and, and they always leave you rather frustrated, those examples, because you feel I, I, we're both parties equally, you know, I, I, when you hear about a reconciliation between a, uh, two, a Hutu and a Tutsi or something in, in, in Rwanda, you sort of think, I'm not being told the whole story here. Um, so I, I deliberately kept illustrations out of that book, whereas in this one, I've done the opposite. I've really crowded it with illustrations mm -hmm. so that pretty much every single point I make in the book is accompanied by some kind of scenario, um, either from fiction, fictional literature or from the news in the last 20, 30 years, or, you know, it's something that people could relate to and engage with. So that, uh, because I guess my fear about this was, it, you know, people could see it as rather abstract and that's what puts people off justice a lot of the time. Uh, but there's, the sh I hope there's nothing abstract about the book. Yeah, no, I've, uh, well, I mean, you, you acknowledge yourself, I think, early in the book or at some point in the book that the argument of the book can tend to be a bit circular because in the end you 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 have to come back to the limits of justice our own complicity our own failures and i wondered might might that also be true of the of, of the trilogy of books um that you know i'm, I'm hit here thinking of when the psalmist speaks of justice and mercy embracing each other kissing each other that, that in the end, in our failures of justice, we, we come back to, well, I mean, one of the chapters, I think, is, is about humility in this book. Yes, I mean, one of the things that, I think the chapter I most enjoyed writing was was called Recognise, which is, and, it, and it, I guess its key illustration is you you go on this passionate march, you get t-shirts, you, 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 you use a, a phone to text your other people on the march, and you drive in a car, and and you protest against something ghastly in society today, but you don't realize that it took 40,000 gallons of water to make your hybrid car, and you don't realize the conditions in which your T-shirt was made, and you don't realize the kind of extractive practices that were used to, to get the materials that, that made your phone and the kind of economic skewing of the world's resources by our demand for phones and things like that. And, and, and I, th I think that humility is often lacking from justice work. I guess two comments about your question. One, one would be, um, that we tend to, uh, I think a lot of people, and I, 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 I'm guessing I speak for a number of people in the audience uh, about this, uh, be rather intimidated about justice, uh, that justice somehow belongs to people of a certain age, probably in their early 20s. Uh, justice belongs to people who are very passionate, who think everybody uh, who's been handling this situation before uh, is self-interested or complacent or lazy. Um, and the, the people can be kind of intimidated about setting their foot in the water, as it were, particularly if they don't, they're don't, worried they're going to be told off the language or the pronouns they're using or, or whatever it might be. Um, and I, a lot of my writing that Paul kindly referred to at the beginning, I think is trying to reclaim areas of faith and practice for people who do feel intimidated by sh more shouty people in other parts of the church or society, uh, I, particularly when I've written about the Bible, I'm very conscious that if you don't have a leather zip up Bible, you, you're often made to feel that Bible doesn't belong to you, it belongs to someone who does. And uh, I want the whole church to love the Bible and the Bible to be a gift to the whole church. And a lot of the writing I've done about the Bible is, is with that in mind, as well as other things. And likewise, writing about justice here, uh, I want people to, to reclaim that that territory, um, uh, e even if they feel, you know, perhaps they're retired, perhaps they, they don't have that engagement through work that they once used to have, or they feel that they're, they're, that they're spending a lot of time with their grandchildren and I don't know how to make anything better in Turkey or Syria or wherever it might be. I, I want to offer way, you know, channels through that, that everyone can feel that they belong in this conversation. 
Mm. Um, uh, and uh, the second thing I think is you've you've referred again to the to the trilogy that the the the, the three books they are it, it, in a sense what they have in common apart from obviously Micah chapter six verse eight from which their titles all come is is that they're they're all kinds of apologetics they're all actually trying to make a case to the world for how Christianity actually works one of my pet uh, dislikes is the word belief particularly as it tends to be used in news journalism that that people have beliefs which means Christians do uh, ridiculous things so that the candidate for the Scottish national um, uh, leadership at the moment uh, who's declared that her convictions don't support same-sex marriage is is put in a category of people who have beliefs and and this is obviously irrational and obscurantist and so on I'm not making any judgment about the the, the issue itself uh, in saying that uh, and and I think a lot of people in contemporary society see Christianity as as having these series of irrational beliefs uh, a bit like the old expression of you know believing a, a hundred things uh, unbelievable things before breakfast um, whereas I'm trying to show in these three books this is how Christianity actually works how it works as a, as a system of thought and life in walk humbly how it works in reconciling relationships and finding peace in love and mercy and how it works in relation to justice in, in this book act, act justly and I guess the one sort of con continuous theme that's run through my whole time as a, a as a priest of, uh, more than 30 years now is is a sense of the powerlessness that people feel as disciples uh, powerlessness to advance the kingdom powerlessness to be holy powerlessness to to make a difference in the world and and I found that from the more affluent and educated parishes I've served and and also from the more deprived parishes I've served so this is a book to empower people and and say this is where you fit in there are 12 different roles here then uh, I think you can probably see yourself in two or three of these but but not necessarily every single one and not necessarily the campaigning marching protesting kind of justice that I think has captured the imagination particularly in recent years yeah, I found very moving the little illustration you used towards the end of the book um, about just the beautiful simplicity of the subversive act of the clergy and the choir at the beginning of an ordinary service in any ordinary church in a little village or a cathedral just walking in behind a cross. Oh. What, what that says about who we are, um, I, I found a very powerful little passage. And... Um, you know, and the book ends with with a, a big discussion about how we how we understand worship. What does it mean to worship? Um, and you 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 subtly shift um, Augustine's understanding that I think is without 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 true worship there can be no justice. I think you I wrote it down. You said right worship is the beginning of true justice, which seemed to be. Oh, I've lost you there, Stephen. Sorry, oh, yes, yeah, I'm muted right. myself by mistake, or I was the thing that muted me as I've had to after some heresy. Yes, you subtly shift Augustine by saying, right worship is the beginning of true justice, which seems to me to be a slightly more humble claim. Mm -hmm. um, and also, I like what you say about baptism. Baptism is the moment God's children become servants of justice. So, so, so how, we, how we act corporately in our baptismal life and our worship is obviously very very important for your understanding of what it means for us to be the church um yes i i, I think um the the way i i reread the book yesterday in preparation for talking with you today and i think my only regret about the book <clears throat> is um and i <clears throat> it's not an absence but it's an understatement is that <clears throat> I think I do try to address it in the in the opening, uh, you know, preface and, and introduction. But uh, it is that I don't say enough about institution building as a form of justice, because you know that has been how I've spent certainly the last eighteen years or so of my life as building institutions, and and uh, I think Paul referred to that at, at the beginning. Um, and and the answer, Paul, to 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 your question about how I 
writes books uh, um, and uh, in the course of doing these sort of jobs leading institutions is is uh, leading institutions and being up in pastoral ministry generally does generate huge numbers of uh, challenges, quandaries, paradoxes uh, that, 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 that you need to reflect on. And you may be a person who writes a diary or a journal, and you may be a person that, that uh, tweets and, and so on. And I think different amongst us reflect in different ways publicly, and, and writing books is the way that I reflect publicly on the kind of challenges that I'm facing. And obviously, I wrote this book. It, I've made no secret of the fact I start and end with a piece on racial justice and climate justice. Um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm leading an institution and I'm leading an institution that has a reputation for addressing things like this, um, which means a lot of people are very passionate, got a lot of concerns about them, feel just as powerless as everybody else. Uh, and this is my best way of distilling, you know, such wisdom as I've found, not obviously just from myself, but from others. Uh, and and that I, you know, I, I find that a helpful process. If other people find that helpful too, then and want to read it and publish it and so on, then that you know that that's great. Um, but life does turf up these kinds of uh, scenarios all the time, and uh, I guess I'm I'm glad to have some record of the story of of that period of, of institutional leadership. So, but I don't really say much about that in the book. I've got an illustration about how a bunch of women during the First World War created. Uh, a hospital in London, which Winston Churchill was the person responsible for dismantling after the war, one of his less reputable uh, events. But, but what that illustration is designed to show is that uh, basically the, the, the best way to, to change the world is to, is, to, is to build an alternative world and let other people come and join in. And I guess that's what I feel I've been spending the last 18 years since I've been leading you know, significant institutions. Uh, every right. parish priest is doing that, and every church warden is doing that. But, but, but in in these particular roles, I've been doing more of that. And that does that isn't as represented in the book as I perhaps wish it was. But I've written about that in uh, in books like Future Big and the Past elsewhere. So there'll always be more yeah. of that. I mean, it's interesting. I mean, people often, as, as somebody who does churn out books as well, people often say to me, "How do you find the time to write the book?" And I never know what to say. Um, I, I often joke and say, uh, oh, I've got a ghostwriter. Uh, and then I realise people don't realise I'm joking. I say, no, no, I, yeah. I, do, I, do, I do write them. But I think, yeah. I, think oh, I, I wrote as many books before they were published as I have done since they were published. It's just the way it's... I, I'm not very good at thinking. It's the way that I s s understand what I'm thinking. Um, so, uh, uh, in a moment, it'd be good to throw this open to the people who are there, who, who I'm sure have got some comments, observations, questions. Um, but, but perhaps, what well, may not be the last question from me, but maybe a last question, um, because I think what you've just said really leads into this, particularly your, the, the hospital analogy about, it, ima about imagining different future. Um, and early on in the book, you, there's a whole, there is a chapter on, Im on ima I think it's called Imagining. Um, so... Um, uh, and, and so you say, justice means everyone has a chance to flourish. Justice is not simply the overthrow of injustice, but the embodiment of healthy and fruitful relationships, etc., etc. So uh, it, well, ten years ago, ten years or so ago, when my kids were still living at home, still teenagers, um, uh, I can't remember his name. There was a comic, a sort of East End geezer of a comic. Um, who he, he, this, his DVD got played endlessly in our house, so we all knew bits of it off by heart. And my favourite sketch, uh, I can't for the life of me think of his name, my favourite sketch was one where he was talking about his school days, um, and it was a careers lesson, and the, and the teacher is asking them to, you know, share with each other their aspirations for what they do when they leave school. So he, as a lad, puts his hand up and says um, that when he leaves school, he wants to be a, a van driver. He wants to drive a van. And all the other kids in the class rise up as one and, and scornfully say to him, you dreamer! <laughs> People, boys from our school don't drive the van, they load the van. <laughs> and this became... Uh, uh, 
And the, but the thing is, in the last couple of years, since I've returned to the north, um, and now serving uh, urban accommodate, I'm thinking particularly of Middlesbrough, but also Hull, the, the, the paucity of dreaming. I mean, the thing which distresses me the most when I go to these schools is they don't dream. Of, uh, it's not that they don't have opportunity. The opportunity isn't there. But they don't even dream of opportunity. Um, and I was talking to some kids very recently from a school. Um, good, good, good kids, but who'd learned early that, that there wasn't going to be flourishing for them. Um, I mean, I found it heartbreaking, but I suppose my last question to you is, so what else do we need to be doing to nurture that imagining of a different future? Well, I, I'm, I, I don't think it's just about class, um, because uh, to take, I guess, one very topical example, uh, HS2. Um, it, it, I have a family member who works in the tunnels somewhere in Hertfordshire and when, you know the rest of the family joke about not having heard, heard from this person for a while they say well they're, they're, you know, they're in a tunnel with a hard hat and, mm. uh, but it, what's just, just demoralising for that uh, family member is, is that they don't know whether it's all going to be cancelled and these tunnels are going to be like the old Channel Tunnel was just left half, half built um, and, and, and obviously there's huge issues of public finance and things uh, in, in, in the course of a recession and so on, I understand that. But the point I'm making is we, uh, I mean, I live in London usually, and imagine London without the underground system. Somebody in around about 1860 decided let's have uh, the tube and spent the next 40 years constructing it. Uh, so that people in our generation, more you know, well over a hundred years later, could benefit from it every day. Untold millions travel on the tube every day. That took vision. <laughs> that took imagination. <coughs> and they must have had, I'm sure they did, uh, all the people saying this is too disruptive, this is too expensive, this, you know, this will... Uh, we'll have to carry on managing with 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 horses and uh, uh, what's wrong with horses and uh, and carts that uh, they're perfectly good um and and i think if we don't have that vision on a large public scale we're basically not believing in a future that's bigger than the past and i think it, uh, imagination is about believing in, believing in a future that's bigger than the past you know it's a phrase i use quite a lot uh, but because i think it's a very significant phrase and I think our society is, is really struggling with that at the moment. And people might say, oh, it's about climate and anxiety about the climate. Uh, but the, the, there have always been major challenges that made us not, you know, there have been constant economic ups and downs in the history uh, of our country and, and elsewhere. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it's looking in the mirror saying, what do we want to leave behind us? And how do we want to be a blessing to future generations? Obviously, climate plays a lot into that. But I think having, you know, having lived on a council estate for, for many years, I recognize what you're describing, uh, Stephen. Uh, but I think it, it, isn't, it isn't just simply a, a matter of people with low educational expectations. Mm. It, is, uh, it is a recognition that the that change can happen in the world uh, things don't always have to be this way, and that I can find some agency in bringing about that change. And that that moment when you discover your own agency uh, is a is a wonderfully releasing moment. And we all we're all very rude about the internet, or of course today's session wouldn't be possible without it. Um, but I think the internet can be that that voice that people gain from obscurity in a way that the institutional model, which I spend most of my life trying to foster, can still fail to do for, for more marginalized, excluded people. Um, but I think the heart of it is, is finding your own agency and, and your ability to make a difference. And unfortunately, of course, it's easier to destroy than it is to construct. And uh, one of the reasons I've put constructing 
justice ahead of correcting justice in the book, which is one of the, I guess, uh, less obvious things in our contemporary society, is because I think, can, you know, upholding the rule of law and um, following the justice system, which includes working hard to correct its mistakes, are profoundly honourable things to be doing on behalf of uh, of others, not just yourself. I think people still have ambition in our country, but it often is am an ambition for themselves rather than an ambition for, for the society as a whole. Brilliant. Th thank you so much, Sam. I think, um, I think it's probably time to see if anybody in the, in the room in Winchester has something to say. So, um, uh, if Paul, if you're still there, um, we're handing back to you in the room. Yes, no, we, we are all still here. Nobody's gone off to get any coffee or anything. So, um, uh, let me explain. We have we have two uh, roving mics. So um, we'd like you to wait until you've got a, a, a mic in your hand um, before asking your question. Otherwise, uh, Sam and Stephen won't be able to hear you. Um, uh, please put up your hands uh, if you have a, a, a question. Um, and we have two mics here. Um, uh, we have, conveniently, somebody right in the middle of the auditorium. Um, both mics are heading in his way. Um, it's a bit of a, it's a competition. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you for the opportunity to ask a question. I'm thinking about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and, uh, in general, acting justly it appears that Patriarch Kirill is firmly behind Putin. How do you see this process of acting justly for the Ukrainian nation? Well, <clears throat> to take uh, Kirill, <clears throat> excuse me, my understanding is that orthodoxy uh, was for a millennium very tied to a uh, a throne and altar model of uh, rule that placed the patriarch and the emperor very close together, particularly in Constantinople. Um, it's then subsequently, since about 1500, been under oppression for 500 years. And uh, obviously communism in Russia uh, was part of that when it comes to the Russian Orthodox Church. What it's struggled to do since 1990, as I understand it, is not to revert back to a throne and altar model by, by which the success of the state and the success of the church were seen as inseparable. And so I think when we criticize Kirill, which many uh, people I respect and know more about the situation than I do have done, I think we're kind of assuming a Western model of the relationship between church and state. Uh, so we're not just criticizing Kirill, we're criticizing decades, if not centuries, if not actually millennia of how the church has been understood in Eastern Orthodoxy. Um, I'm obviously un unhappy to have a church leader so unambiguously endorsing uh, an illegal and monstrous invasion. But I think we, we need to show, you know, we need to educate ourselves about how such a, you know, whenever we see something that seems bizarre on the TV, we, we have to do some work to find out how this came to pass and not just say what a terrible man, because, it, because the people around him don't think he's a terrible man. Uh, they're thinking in the same way that he does. Moving to how we respond to Ukraine, well, uh, I, I think I'm sure there are plenty of people in the audience who have hosted Ukrainians, uh, and and I think hosting Ukrainians is is a way of reaching that kind of empowerment that I was speaking of uh, with Stephen, and finding some agency in the situation. <coughs> Obviously, we despair of being able to affect 300,000 troops marching across a border uh, and the logistics of, of the sheer number of Russians compared to the sheer number of Ukrainians, though the Ukrainians seem to be doing pretty well of getting hold of some good kit 
but but we could, we each have the opportunity either to host or if our circumstances don't allow hosting to aid the uh, opportunities of Ukrainians, particularly as they start to move into their own accommodation and yet still often are looking for language opportunities and other kinds of entry points into our culture and economy. Um, so I think uh, on a personal level, for my own well-being, I try not to lament what I can't do so much as try to find some agency in, in what I can do. And unusually in the situation, compared to say the Turkey-Syria earthquake, uh, there does seem to be some things that, that many of us can actually do. Could I add a brief thought? You're in charge, Stephen. Uh, yeah, well, <laughs> I'm not sure I am anymore. But, uh, well, yeah. I mean, I mean, just a brief thought, but building on what Sam has said, and also, you know, particularly on the, the final things he was saying in our conversation, uh, it, it seems to me that one of the learnings for me and for us uh, of the past year is uh, that peace is not something you can take for granted. And I think in Europe, we have taken peace for granted. Um, and we've forgotten that... Uh, many, if not all of the institutions that were built in the 40s and 50s were built in order to um, maintain peace. Um, and we've lost trust in them. In some cases, as with Brexit, we've abandoned them, um, forgetting why one of the main motivators for them coming into being was to prevent war. Um, uh, uh, and to make war difficult, if not unthinkable. Um, and I think uh, this has been a huge wake-up call for the West upon, if I could borrow Sam's striking phrase, um, uh, believing in a future that's bigger than the past. That, that was certainly the case 70 years ago. And we built institutions that would enable that to happen. And we've allowed ourselves to become cynical, complacent about them, to imagine that we can do without them. Um, uh, and uh, for me, that's been disastrous in the life of our nation, and it, and it could be further disastrous in the life of our world. Um, uh, you know, the economic union was never about the economy, it was about peace. Can I speak? Um, I wonder how you think that justice and law bounce off each other, because um, taking on from, from what Stephen was just saying, uh, it strikes me we're incredibly privileged to live in under a rule of law. Um, but two things very recently make me wonder where we stand on this in terms of justice. One is that a few weeks ago, uh, Judge Tate at, I think, Middlesex Crown Court, sentencing some climate protesters, forbade them to speak in court or to the jury about their motivation or even mention anything about the climate. One of them defied that, and he's doing two months now for contempt of court. So that in a way, there was a, a, I think there was a legal and a justice thing happening there. Last week, in Wolverhampton Crown Court, uh, Judge Wilkinson, with similar protesters, said, look, I've got to find you guilty. But, I mean, to cut a very long story short, he said, you're admirable people. You've persuaded me totally. Um, I really regret what I'm having to do. But he banned them over, I think, gave them a year's conditional discharge. Where, where do justice and law sit? I'm really sorry. I think it's probably the same for Sam. Is I really found it hard to catch that question. Paul, is it possible for you to... I'm, go, I'm just going to answer the question I think it was asking, <laughs> if that's all right. I think that's, that's a better use of time. So I do have an illustration in the book. I'm a Bristolian. I, I went to school in Bristol, grew up just outside Bristol, uh, about the uh, taking down of the Edward Colson statue uh, and all the publicity around that, which obviously was greater during the, well, more intense COVID time. Stephen's reminded us that COVID isn't over. Um, 
and what happened in that case was the 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 people that did take down the statue were more or less let go in the end um, because uh, of the kinds of things the questioner was referring to that that the judge put things in in a, in a, in a larger story and that's a, that's a point that didn't actually come out in Stevens and my discussion a few moments ago, but I think it's relevant to mention here is that a lot of this is about story. A lot of this is about where the story begins. Uh, Stephen referring to the the the, lo the longer view on some of our institution, our cross national institutions, uh, coming back to the Second World War, and all the institutions that that were created in the wake of that. Uh, and I think the same is true about issues of racial justice and climate justice, is when you perceive the story to begin, often when people protest, uh, the assumption is they just woke up and got out of bed that morning and were really cross and caused disruption for other people and that should be stopped, everyone should be allowed to get on with their lives. But of course the climate justice story doesn't begin uh, there, you know, Lynn White famously says it begins in, in Genesis 1 with a notion of dominion. I think the more thoughtful uh, descriptions of, of the climate uh, justice use who probably begin in the Enlightenment with a, a, a sense of rationality that, that uh, distances humanity from the wider creation. I think that's a, probably a better place to begin the story. But either way, it's 250 years ago. Uh, and so to say it starts the day that someone goes on a protest obviously is quite short-sighted. However, uh, so I do think it's all about narrative and my uh, book, um, Humbler Faith, uh, Bigger God, is, is really all about that. But the, the thing about the law, as I think the questioner was referring to, and I apologize if I misunderstood the question, um, is is the law works by isolating just one part of the story and putting it under the microscope and says on the morning of the 25th of January uh, you were lying down in a motorway and stopping an ambulance uh, getting to the hospital after someone had had a heart attack and you jeopardized people's lives by lying down in the motorway and and when you put it as narrowly as that which the law does that's what the law does uh, then, then the case becomes a rather different one, which is why I talk in the book about, about I guess, the difference between justice, uh, understood in a legal sense, and social justice, understood with that larger story being taken into account. Sam, can I just interject? Um, because one of the, um, the pleasures of, of looking at legal judgments is, is precisely that, um, that concentration, that scrutiny of of the situation, um, which, which is a, as somebody who reads a lot of waffle, is, is I find quite thrilling. But you're saying, and, and I think our, our questioner is saying that if you if you cut the story out of the, the the judgment, then what sort of judgment are you creating? Oh dear, I think I just missed your the crucial words in the, your last couple of sentences. Uh, with the um, if you if you take story out of legal judgment, then what sort of justice are you able to create? Yeah, but again, I'm going to answer the question I think you've asked. So, um, uh, I, I think you're saying what kind of justice do you create if you take this, this wider view? I, I, I think we, it, it's, a, it's a classic case with our judges, and you can see this happening in Israel at the moment with the attempt to dismantle the power of the Supreme Court is, to, is and, and we had this with uh, Boris Johnson uh, uh, proroguing Parliament and then making all the tabloid newspapers say awful things about the judges. We, we do put a lot of responsibility on our judges for interpreting the law. And uh, I, I, I think that's an unavoidable human element and a good human element in in our uh, balance of power within our constitution and I think it's for, from the distance that I am I think it's terrible what's being proposed in Israel and you've got this sinister sense that um, the Prime Minister of Israel is actually doing this to avoid corruption charges of his own but um, we 
the reason I'm highlighting the role of judges in response to what I think was your question is that uh, those those judges become significant storytellers or story listeners. And there are occasions, and I think the previous questioner referred to them, where the judge can use quite a lot of discretion, either in pronouncing someone guilty and then making the sentence one that is non-custodial and possibly not even financial, um, or in, uh, in, in, you know, in a number of ways in terms of sentencing and summing up. That that and then that's what summing up is when when a, when a judge sums up a case is they're they're telling a story and particularly when they've got a jury they're guiding the the, the jury what story uh, to perceive themselves to to, to to be in. So you can't avoid the the link between justice and story. I guess is is is, is what I'm saying. And and a, a lot of a, a lot of cases of justice and I've referred to the difference in justice and social justice are about what breadth of story you perceive yourself to be in. Thank you. I think we've got time for uh, one or two questions. Um, do, if uh, there's somebody down here, and then maybe the, the lady in the middle. I, I'm sorry that we don't, we're, we're running out of time, but... Um, Hello. You're we've much clearer we've, now we've Paul, talked a, a lot about justice, but where does our anger getting sort of caught up in this because I think we need to be a church that's angry about so many people living such struggling with so many things in their lives and when do we get angry justice kind of can sometimes feel a bit sort of sofa uh, kind of like and I, sometimes I think the church maybe does it need to be angry does justice have a place for it well uh I think anger and powerlessness are often very much linked. You, you know, when I think of when I become angry, I become angry about something that's wrong. Uh, unfortunately, too much of my anger is self-referential and, and about things that are wrong that I feel have been done to me. Um, I'm probably not the only one like that. But, um, but where you can't see how to make it better. Uh, I guess what I'm trying to do in this book is, is uh, that the chapters seven, eight, and nine engage with the anger um, in, the, uh, in the correcting injustice section of the book. But what I'm also suggesting is that by putting constructing justice ahead of correcting injustice, uh, I'm saying, as I've said quite a lot in this conversation today, uh, about the value of building institutions, of finding your own agency and, and, and empowerment in actually making the world a better place. Uh, and as Stephen has helpfully said, doing that over the long term and recognizing the institutions that, for example, came out in the Second World War are still well worth investing in and are best, you know, better to invest in the United Nations uh, than to lament the invasion of Ukraine, I guess is a, is a one sentence way of putting it. Um, the thing about anger, and I do possibly talk too much about this in the book, I don't know, um, is, is that in anger, you can lose sight of the nuance of a situation, you can become very headstrong, uh, and also you can do a number of things that I find quite problematic. Uh, one of which is, uh, people may know, I've written a lot of books about the difference between the word for and the word with. So when you're giving a voice to the voiceless, um, you're often speaking for people who are voiceless, which is in, in many ways compounding their oppression. Uh, if one uses one's anger to give, give people who don't have a voice a voice of their own, uh, it, that seems to me much better. That's much more of a with thing than speaking for them, uh, which in, in the end is just transferring their voicelessness from some faceless body to yourself. So that, that's what happens in anger is you get you can get very carried away. You can you can lose all the detail. You can sit, you lose the sight of the people in the midst of the, the situation, and uh, and you can proceed as if you you were the only person whose whose opinion matters. And I guess I'm I'm partly writing the book for people who feel that sense of anger, which I don't necessarily disagree with and sometimes share. I mean, I think certainly in my early years in ministry and what drove me into spending 10 years working in deprived areas um, was, was a, 
sense of anger, which I would now acknowledge, I probably wasn't so aware of it at the time. Um, but I hope that I can do, uh, exercise that anger by building institutions, albeit local parish churches on quite a humble level, uh, for people actually to do something about it. The other problem with anger is it tends to assume, it's like the expression uh, speaking truth to power, that I have all the truth and you have all the power. A lot of what I'm trying to encourage people to, to find is, is where, where their own power lies. And so rather than be angry with someone else and assume uh, that somebody else should change everything, to find our own power and recognize the change we're, we're capable of making. And to, to do that, we have to let go of some of our anger and channel that same energy, but not lose the energy and channel that energy into collaborative working, which which is a, a longer and humbler exercise in, in my experience. Yeah, just just to add briefly, um, uh, uh, for me, there's, there's there's no shortage of anger uh, around. Um, have a have a little. Uh, you go on go on Twitter for a for a few moments, and you'll see it all. Um, huge amount of anger and, and vitriol flowing from it. So, so I, I really want to build on what Sam has said. The, the question is, what do we do? What do you do with the anger? Um, and, uh, and, and what I see too much of is a kind of indulgent giving into it, um, uh, which is then displayed in destructive, self-indulgent ways, deeply, deeply hurtful to others. Um, uh, and uh, that's, that's, the, that's the negative side of, of the internet and social media in particular. But, but there is a positive energy to anger. And, and if, if you channel the positive energy into reimagining different futures, um, then anger, anger can be a good thing. So anger itself, I think, is neutral. There's plenty of it about. Um, but what I find alarming is the way in which uh, I see fewer and fewer examples of people channeling that into different futures and more and more yeah, ch channeling it into into a hate a hatefulness and a and a degradation, um, where we just live in our silos and echo chambers, re reinforcing our prejudices, um, taking pots at each other, um, and it's 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 deeply deeply damaging. Sam and Stephen, I I, I think. I would like to squeeze one more question in, um, but I'm, I'm conscious that if we, if we run over time, then there'll be a lot of angry people unable to get their, their coffee before the next session. So, um, we'll speak very fast. Yes, thank you. One, one more question in the middle, the lady with her hand up. Yeah, could you pass it along? Thank you. Thank you. I'll make it a quick question. Um, to both of you, I just want to go back to um, the point about the lack of aspiration, the paucity of dreaming, I think, was Stephen's term that he used. And I just wanted to ask both of you what you felt was at the basis of this. Is it a, a fear of failure, a fear of being ostracized, a lack of agency? I'd just be interested in your views, because I think it's, it is a, a deep, deep tragedy in our current world. Just checking, did, did you catch that, both of you? Um, yes. Yes, yeah, excellent. Stephen, do you want? Let, let, I'll go first, then Sam can have the last word. Also, because I, I mean, because I, I, I think I needed advance written warning of such a such a profoundly interesting question. Um, so, uh, so a number of things immediately spring to mind. I mean, I mean, perhaps the one thing to focus on is is leadership. Um, that I, I think what our world needs is 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 leaders who who can raise the sights of people's imagination. And by leaders, well, let me just give one very little example. I, 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 of course, I'm thinking of prime ministers and bishops and goodness knows who else, but actually I'm not really thinking about them. I, so when my kids played in a football team, um, the manager of this football team, this is when they're seven or eight years old, you know, Saturday morning football leagues. The football manager... Um, one of the high values of the team was that everyone got a game, which was kind of counterculture and counterintuitive to the way most football and sports goes, because everyone gets a game, which sometimes meant the, the 
the possibility or even the certainty of winning was sometimes sacrificed for the higher value of everyone getting a game. And these are, these were six, seven, eight-year-old little boys. Um, he got a lot of anger from parents on the touchline when the very good player was taken off so that the kid who wasn't so good got to play for 10 minutes at the end of the match, but he turned out a cold Saturday morning like everybody else. I, I, I so admired this man. I so admired his counterintuitive dream um, uh, and uh, and I believe my sons who played in that team learned a huge amount from him about reconfiguring the world. And so at every level, I think I long for leaders to understand the agency and influence they have, you know, be it a Saturday morning football team or, or anything else for that matter. But there's loads more that could be said. Good question. Um, so, great question, and, and a couple of things to say about it. I, I think, um, f first of all, we have a, uh, we, we've, we've just come out of COVID, uh, apart from Stephen, and <laughs> there was a sense of unity during that time, uh, akin to going through a war together. Uh, and I, I, I don't want to lose that sense of how is the world going to be better after this, which is a question that in May 2020, everybody was asking. And now it seems like a people were so relieved to be out of COVID, they forgot about that question. And then the problems, you know, associated with the cost of living and energy prices and plenty else have taken away that sense that we could actually make make things better. Um, and I, I do think the story of the Bible is all about uh, the lessons people learn in adversity, inspiring them for bigger futures, the exile in the Old Testament and the cross in the New Testament, most obviously. Uh, and that sense of going through pain together and resolving what a better future would be like is at the heart of the Christian faith. Uh, I, I think a, a, another point about it is is a bit like Stephen I would say uh, the, the teaching profession is the absolute backbone of the country it, it seems to me that my head teacher died uh, just a month ago and I sent a video for his uh, funeral which I couldn't attend uh, but in that video I basically talked about him that the, the there are uh, the, 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 there, are, there are two kinds of teachers. There are teachers that want you to become like like them, and there are teachers uh, that that want you to grow way past them and, and, and think that their achievement is you outgrowing them in where, ways they couldn't imagine. And that sense of a teacher who, who believes that, who has higher aspirations for their kids than they have for them, even for themselves, I think is is at the heart of, of learning to dream again, and I think we are a country that needs to, uh, that needs to learn to dream again. Uh, and I think teach, the teaching profession, in the way that it's paid, in the way that it's respected, in the way that it's talked about by comedians and whatever, um, is is crucial. And I think the last point I'd make, just a rather somber note to, to end on, is a, a, just a slight counter to to Stephen's very vivid description of leadership is that I think when we feel very weak ourselves, we're inclined to look to very wonderful leaders to take us to wonderful places. Unfortunately, the history of our church and of society more generally is of feeling very let down by some of those people and some of the most inspiring people who turn out to have feet of clay and sometimes a lot worse than feet of clay. Uh, and I think that's a sign, not that we have, you know, particular individuals who we feel have let us down, uh, but, but a sense that, that in maybe starting with a leader, we, we realize that we need to become leaders ourselves. And that applies to everybody in the audience today is, is rather than to say, haven't we had a dreadful bunch of prime ministers, is to say, how can we each exercise leadership in our own sphere? Uh, that we can inspire people to a future bigger than the past, uh, that we can tell a bigger story, uh, and that we can bring those who follow us to outgrow us in imagination uh, and in justice. Sam, thank you very much indeed. Stephen, thank you very much indeed. Um,
I, I, I hope you heard that. Um, uh, you've had all the hard work of, of um, preparing and, um, and talking so um, interestingly for, for, for a whole hour without the pleasure of, of seeing the, the effect you've been having on us. Um, it's, it's been an extraordinary start to the morning, and especially such an early start for you, Sam. So we're, great admiration, great thanks, and, and we wish you both well. Thank you very much indeed.